In 1994, a lone female hitchhiker accepted a ride from four Alabama teenagers. It would be a decision that she would live to regret. One that would lead to an orgy of unimaginable violence and allegations of satanic sacrifice. This is what happens when a group of dysfunctional and highly disturbed young men decide that they have found the perfect victim. This is the murder of Vicky Biblia. Thank you for joining me. I do have a puppy that's decided to just jump on the bed with me. So if she's in and out, I apologize in advance. She wants me to play with her duck. Well, that was once a duck. Now it's just a shadow of its former self. Also, just want to say before I start, for those of you who are supporting me on YouTube membership and on Patreon, I cannot do this without you. You have no idea how much it matters to me that you contribute, and I just want to say a massive thank you. Also, for those of you who want to come and see me at a live show, I am all over the UK this year, next year, and actually going to be the year after as well when I come back with another particular theatre show. It's so nice meeting you. And for those of you who kind of say hi on my live chats when I'm doing my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday, and you're all there with me, just it's great seeing your faces because you all are part of my cyber family and it's impressive to me that you care so deeply. So massive thank you. Let's get on with today's case. As I said, wow, it's a tough one. I don't think any of you will have heard of it. So 37 year old Vicky Lynn Diblia. She was a mother of two. She was born on the 18th of April, 1956. I will tell you, I have looked high and low and I mean, I've gone everywhere. I've tried everything, including ancestry, including sites that specialize in this kind of area. And I can't find any pictures of her online, which I feel really terrible about because I want you to know who she was physically. The idea that I can't find that information about her is really difficult for me because I love to tell you about the person that she was and the life that she had. I think so often when we look at reports of crimes, that's what's overlooked, that these are real human beings who had their lives stolen. And in Vicky's case, that's absolutely what happened in the most heinous of ways. So apologies that I don't have a picture of her. I will keep looking in the interim, but it's been two weeks now and I haven't turned anything up. So in early 1994, what I do know is that she briefly lived with her partner at the time, Elmer Andrew Smith. That was in Chattanooga. Now that is a city in southeastern Tennessee. In February 1994, for whatever reason, Vicky told him that she wanted to return to West Monroe, Louisiana, to live with her mother. So this led on the night of the 21st of February 1994 for Elmer to drive Vicky to the Alabama Georgia state line. And he basically left her at an exit ramp on Interstate 59. Now I'm not gonna blame Elmer for doing that at the end of the day. We all know certainly in the 90s, hitchhiking was very popular. We also know serial killers, etc. know that because we see that time and time again in cases that I've covered, such as with Ed Kemper, these are individuals who are literally on the lookout for victims and if you happen to fit their particular predilection and prototype of an individual that they like to carry out these horrific fantasies on then you are the person who will be picked up by them even though they are rare what i am saying is it is not ideal for a woman to be by herself on an evening on the georgia state line because essentially you don't know who's driving past so she stood there and just after he's dropped her off, she basically calls her mother. 
She tells the mum that she's going to be travelling home to Louisiana and she says that she's going to be doing this by bus or by plane. But it seems like Vicky just wanted to reassure her mum and she knew that she had other plans to get back. She just didn't want her mum to worry because I don't know if my child rang me and was like, Mum, I'm just like on the state line. I'm going to get all the way back to Louisiana. Okay, how? I was going to hitch with random strangers. I would scream, the phone would be dropped and I would literally drive to pick them up immediately. Even if I did not have a car or I did not know how to drive. Thus, is the way I feel about my kids. But she's reassuring her mum because she doesn't want her to be concerned and because obviously her mum is going to react in the way that I've just said. And what's really difficult is that for Vicky's mother, she will be sitting there thinking how lovely it's probably going to be to see her daughter and she's probably concerned about why she's decided to leave her partner and she's probably preparing all the things that she can offer her child on that return so that she feels safe, warm, heard, all those things. But she doesn't realise that Vicky's made out a fatal, to some degree, part of the story, which is that she is going to hitchhike her way there. And that's a journey she never gets to complete. That was the last time that Vicky's mother ever spoke to her. Now, Vicky did actually make it as far as Jefferson County in Alabama. And it's at this point that really unfortunately for her, a group of teenagers who were traveling on Interstate 59, they see her, they notice her at an interstate exit. And this is around 1 a.m. in the morning. So again, I'm not judging the fact that she was left by her brief partner in that situation. I just, don't really condone people leaving a woman by herself because I think you are immediately at risk. When we hear about violent offenders, what do they tell us? They go for vulnerability, availability and desirability. And certainly the vulnerability and availability is absolutely there in this situation. So they see her, like I say, around 1 a.m. And the group of young men it's comprised of 18-year-old Carrie Dale Grayson, 17-year-old Kenneth Loggins, 17-year-old Trace Royal Duncan, and also 16-year-old Lewis Christopher Mangione. I do believe I've pronounced that correctly. Now, Grayson's parents, let's look at him first. So his mother and father had divorced when he was just three years of age, and he'd lived with his mother, but then she died when he was 12. So, I mean, that's a lot of sadness in Grayson's life, without a doubt. Firstly, the fact that his parents split up, but even though he won't have had necessarily a memory of that, certainly we can note that the psychological implications for children are slightly less positive when they have divorced parents. And bear in mind, at no point am I suggesting that single mums do not do a great job. They do. I was a single mum for a long time. So I'm saying that the evidence that we have psychologically from a lot of research out there is that children with two parents, at least in scenarios where those parents get on, certainly seem to fare better than their single parent counterparts. And like I said, that's not a criticism. It's just a reality within the research. So he's first of all got this small level of dysfunction in his reality. And I imagine that he won't have had the greatest memory of his father in the home. But nonetheless, impact of abandonment is very clear when we work or talk to or research children who did have a parent remove themselves from the household. And then add to that, at 12 years of age, he's literally in a scenario when he's lost his mother, she dies. That will be another enormous fracture. He then goes and lives with his dad. And it seems to be that this is a point where things change quite a lot. So first of all, he starts hanging around with a really challenging group of young people. And he doesn't have any interests whatsoever in education. He was known to be really hyperactive in class, didn't do any work, didn't complete any homework assignments. And I think that lots of us can relate to the fact that sometimes that is symptomatic behavior. The struggles emotionally and internally that are going on create 
a reaction where the child interacts and acts out to take the emphasis off the issues that they're having in school, such as completing work, but also attentionally focuses people on them, even if that's for bad reason, because it feels at least that they're getting noticed. So he certainly is deflecting from the academia. I imagine that's genuinely because he's struggling. But as I said, there's also potentially that wanting to be seen, wanting to be noticed that many young people don't feel a curse for them in school. Now, he stops going to school entirely when he's 16. And I will note at this point that when I did my research on the wider family unit, they did have a history of mental illness within the family. As we all know, that does not make somebody a killer. But sometimes killers will also have mental health issues. So that's what I've learned about this particular individual in his childhood. Then we look at logins. So he also has a really relatively troubled dysfunctional upbringing. So he's abandoned by both of his parents at an early age, which is very challenging for any child. I mean, they're meant to be your primary caregivers. They're meant to be your mentors. They're meant to be the individuals that make you feel safe. They're the person that you go home to after a bad day and confide in. If you're abandoned by them, you often internalize that and think, what the hell is wrong with me? And that can cause chaos for a young person at any stage with respect. He starts using drugs around the age of 13. Again, this is a problem, particularly if there are mental health issues in the family, which it seems that there are, and he himself had mental health issues throughout his life. Drugs additionalized to that situation can cause extra problems and it's worth noting that this particular individual he was very depressed through his life suicidal self-harmed he was also known to be very easily led and again he just starts falling in with i suppose we would call them a stereotypically bad crowd but not enviable children not the kind of kids that you want your kids to meet kind of the absolute opposite extreme over the kind of kids that you want to meet. And at one point, is even involved with far-right Nazi groups of skinheads. I mean, that's reprehensible. Let's just throw it out there right now. To be involved with far-right Nazi groups of skinheads means you are a major racist and kind of only concerned with white supremacy. That's the absolute logistics of that belief system. And they are not the kind of human beings one would wish to have around for a Sunday dinner. But also, when you're a young person, certainly who has potentially had dysfunction in your life, and you're alone, isolated, depressed, you don't feel that connected, and then you find a group of people that actually allow you that connection, it can place you in a whole heap of difficult predicaments. It does not excuse his motivation. I do not doubt for one minute that he had affiliations, therefore, and beliefs that would be considered racist. I'm just saying that I would imagine part of the motivation of joining that group at such an early age is because they give him the positive strokes that he lacks in his life. And without a doubt, it's these negative associations that I feel are very much why the deadly consequences I'm going to talk about today occur. He was actually known at times for sleeping in a cemetery. And that concerns me deeply. It concerns me deeply. I was a goth. We liked a lot of graveyards. Often, we would go around and just read the actual inscriptions on the graves. I don't know why. We just like doing it. I believe emo kids do that as well. But the idea of sleeping in a cemetery, that says something that makes me feel a little bit malevolent orientated. I feel like he wants you to see him as somebody who is dark by nature. And also he carried around this black notebook. And in that black notebook, it just documented his fascination with death and dying and satanic worship and there are actually some psychological symmetries there with people who do things like mass kill so certain school shooters certainly document this fascination with death and dying it's almost as if this ideation 
with what's next is so fascinating and compelling and part of that might be that in this world they don't feel seen and visible and therefore if they connect with what they believe is after there is some meaning to their world particularly when we're talking about satanism and things that are far more malevolent in nature because there are many beliefs around some good some bad that have this idea certainly where devil worship is concerned that there is a power to be harnessed in those who follow and this little black book that he's got it's about satanic worship and as i said all of these very dark connections with an obsession with death and dying now a friend of his claimed that he had actually seen him in his youth hang a kitten by its tail and then beat it to death honestly at this point i'm like can we just agree on changing the law? If somebody does that to an animal, any animal, by the way, can we remove them from society for a minimum of five years and place them in intensive therapeutic secure units? I don't think it's okay to ever do that kind of stuff. And it deeply concerns me when they do. It really deeply disturbs me when they do end of the fact that there is some kind of connection for him with torture and death massive massive alarm bells i'm going off in every single one of your heads as well as mine also his rage in school was said to be absolutely uncontrollable he would have outbursts of anger on a pretty much daily basis so what are we seeing there very poor impulse control when you think about school I try not to with respect, I'm haunted by it. But when you do think about school, you also think about authoritarianism because there are rules and regulations and you have to do what you're told. You think about behavior codes because they exist within there and there are consequences if you fail to adhere to them. If you want Karen and you're just like throwing yourself around on a daily basis, you are somebody who has very poor control of your emotions. And apparently during those episodes, he was unaware of what was happening so there was a level of disassociation and he would come round to some degree and wonder what had actually happened so clearly we're looking at somebody who's very emotionally disturbed i would almost hazard a guess that there is a high level of trauma in his childhood that maybe wasn't necessarily that acknowledged at the time now unfortunately I don't have a lot of information about Trace Duncan and Louis Magnione. I only have photos of them and those photos are pretty recent. What I will say is it's apparent that they were associates of Loggins and Grayson and the group were considered a really bad crowd. They actually had a reputation for being skinhead Satanists. I kid you not. I mean, that's just... The worst of the worst of the worst, isn't it? Where are you going tonight, love? I'm um, just out to hang out with my mates. Who are your mates? Got any interests? We have got quite a lot of interests. What kind of interests? By the way, why have you shaved all your hair off? Oh, I've just found this interesting group of uh, blokes. What do they do? Well, they're very much into a particular type of faith. Oh, like in Buddhism, where they don't have hair and... They're very faithful in their beliefs. Kind of just like that, yeah. Apart from we hate anybody that isn't white and we believe in the devil. I'll have your supper on later on and have a good, have a good time. Don't bring them home ever. Locks door, bolts it, advertise home, moves immediately. But anyway, I digress. Just not the best, is it? skinhead satanists anyway the night that these four teenagers are out and they spotted vicky they've been driving around at this point in grayson's car and they've been drinking beer they've been smoking cannabis so they're under the influence also i want you to imagine the kind of characters that we've talked about so far and then additionalize alcohol and drugs that in itself is something that can reduce inhibitions 
and exacerbate and amplify certain concerns that we've talked about regarding the mental health of these individuals and certainly the aspirations that they have. Now, when they actually offer Vicky a lift, they are intoxicated. They aren't within what we could consider an appropriate state of mind to be driving a vehicle. But they offer her a lift. This is in the early hours of the 22nd of February, 1994. And Vicky wants a lift. You know, it's really early hours of the morning. So she tells them that she's heading for Louisiana and they just agree to drive her there. But they say, look, we will get you there as long as you arrange a place for us to stay the night. I think that that was very manipulative and very clever because the very fact that they future focus her thought process when they pick her up and say, where are you going? And she says, Louisiana. If they had just said, okay, cool, just get in, we'll drive you there. She may have been on the back foot a little bit because they're offering a lift, but she may also have been a little bit suspicious. You know, maybe that's a bit too far of a drive. These look like young men. Maybe this isn't gonna be an appropriate thing to do. But they additionalize that scenario by saying, when you get to Louisiana, you have to give us something back you need to give us somewhere to stay. So now she's thinking, oh, that's cool. They're going to drive me there, but actually they want to kind of hang out and I'll sort some kind of accommodation out for them at that point. And therefore she gets in the car after agreeing to that. And that decision genuinely would be the worst decision that she ever made. And it would be one that she would live to regret, but only temporarily because it was going to, end her life essentially. So instead of driving to the interstate as they've promised Vicky, Grayson actually drives to a dirt road and heads towards a place known as the Pipelines. Now, this is a wooded area and it's where local teenagers hang out. It's often where they go to take drugs, to drink, to be together. And I think we all remember places like that when we were kids. They were the places our parents told us not to go and inevitably we always went. But the Vicky, this is a red flag. You know, she's not a kid. She's in her 30s. And she's now going down into an area that firstly is off the beaten track and secondly isn't what they've agreed. So she's getting really nervous, but they tell her to chill out. And Grayson then has this other story. He says, listen, it's absolutely cool. Don't worry about this. Just chill out. All we've got to do is get Login's truck. It's parked in the area. And basically it's a way more reliable vehicle for the journey. And she's going to want to believe that. What do I always say about psychological bias? You're not sitting there thinking, my God, maybe these individuals are going to harm me. Maybe this is going to be the last journey I take. You're thinking, sure, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. They're just under the influence. Let's just go along with this and everything is going to be fine. So when the group arrive at the pipelines, the four teenagers, they all get out of the car. And Vicky is obviously feeling nervous and she's a bit worried about where she is because she is sensible. She's an adult after all. And so she just stays in the vehicle. She felt probably and most likely like she couldn't trust them because there was a potential sexual assault that might occur. And I completely concur with that belief system in this scenario, because if you're a woman on your own and there's four guys and they're not children, they're late teenagers, physically one of them is going to be able to overwhelm and overpower you. So four, you will just be a sitting duck. It is as simple as that. So staying in the vehicle and just kind of quietly being present without getting involved with them felt like the safest move for her without a doubt. Now, the reason that she was concerned about sexual assault was also because they were trying it on with her. They kept kind of being overtly sexual towards her and she just keeps turning the sexual advances down. But the anxiety level at that point is gonna be really profound because it's potentially all going to slide and you're gonna know that, but what can you do? You're in a really strange place. You don't know the area, it's really dark. These guys are the only way you're getting out as far as you're concerned. You can't 
aggravate them. There's four of them. You don't want to engage with them because it could lead to something very, very dark as far as you're concerned. And you don't trust them. But who can you trust right now? You're in the middle of nowhere. So they all carry on drinking. They carry on smoking cannabis. And Vicky just sits in the car and watches. Now, at one point, she did get out of the vehicle because she needed to go to the loo. And it's during this time, Grayson just says to his friends that he was going to sacrifice the B-I-T-C-H. Yeah, that's literally what he says. He's going to sacrifice her. Also, logins. He refers to her as the perfect victim. So this is all going on. And Vicky is sensing something. She's worried about something. She knows that something's going to kick off. So when Vicky returns, clearly she's got some insight. She's feeling unnerved about this scenario. And so apparently she goes and says to them that they best not try anything with her because if they do, she will kill them. Now, I actually don't believe that. That's in the research I've done. It's certainly demonstrated in the literature, etc. But I do not think a woman of her age with four men that she's feeling deeply uneasy around is going to turn up and basically threaten to kill them. The only way I would buy into that is if we didn't realise that Vicky had just popped off, grabbed an AK-47, an Uzi and a shotgun and was handy with them all. At that point, I'm like, yeah, she probably would have threatened to kill them. But that is very unlikely. And I think that people ultimately use these kind of opportunities to minimise their attack and maximise the reason for it. So to say that she threatened to kill them is an invitation, essentially, that they will be using for their actions. And it seems that whatever happens at this point after she's relieved herself and returned to the group, things turn really, really violent. So Grayson approaches her and then he just strikes her in the head with a beer bottle. Loggins punches her and Vicky is having every single one of her worst nightmares coming true in this moment in time. So she just starts to run. She bolts. So Loggins runs after her and then he actually throws a beer bottle at her and it hits her in the back of the head and she falls to the ground. And essentially, at that moment, as opposed to realising that they've hurt her, as opposed to just taking a step back from the reality of what they've done, they just start this relentless attack upon her. This is a defenceless woman just trying to get home to her mum. And these men are now beating her beyond recognition. They repeatedly kick her. They stamp all over her head, all over her body for at least 30 minutes. For any of you out there who have ever been in a physical altercation, often they last seconds and their marks can last for years because they're so traumatising. Imagine being attacked by four young adults for 30 minutes. And in fact, some of the reports that I've read, they suggest that the attacks lasted for hours. Hours. And there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that there was a full intention to kill her. This isn't a scenario where things got out of hand, they assaulted her, she died, it was a terrible mistake. Even those I struggle to ever acknowledge as anything other than murder, but we do see certain scenarios where people genuinely didn't intend to kill, and they end up with a manslaughter charge. We're not looking at that territory here. We're talking about a prolonged, aggressive attack that went on and on and on, and the full intention was to kill her. And when they realised that she was still alive, because it is outstandingly astonishing how much the human body can take, it really is. The desire to survive is something that I think few of us, fortunately, will ever have to contend with. But when you are in a scenario like this and you're being beaten horrifically, your body has that much adrenaline going around it. It's trying to stop you bleeding out and so on and so forth. And you are just clinging on. And Vicky was clinging on. And that annoys them. So when they realise that she's still alive, despite this heinous 
attack. Loggins just stands on her throat. And Grayson actually supports Loggins doing this. So he is used by Loggins for balance so he doesn't fall over. And during that, he bounces up and down on her throat. And it's all about preventing her from breathing. And allegedly, he even said, hurry up and die. Ultimately, she gurgled and she then choked up blood. And according to those young men, her final words were, okay, I'll party. And then she died. That's another reason why I don't believe the whole, I'll kill you BS. I think that she was threatened physically and sexually. I think the likelihood is that she was resisting that and that incited even more violence. And the fact that she says, okay, I'll party those being her closing words, it suggests that she had been resistant to party with them. And then in that final survival mechanism moment, she utters those words. Her death was horrific. It was slow. It was painful. She was aware right until the last second. Right until the last millisecond. Her killers, well, they just laughed. They found her final words really funny. But it's not over. If that's not disrespectful, diabolical, reprehensible and unbelievably sadistic enough, they then decide to place a body in the back of Loggins' pickup truck. They drive to a cliff on Bald Rock Mountain, which is in St. Clair County, Alabama. And here they remove all of Vicky's clothing and they take her body from the vehicle and then they desecrate her. So they take her clothes off, as I've said, they take a ring from her finger, they then play with her naked corpse, defile it essentially, they poke her body with sticks, they kick her body, they even take a beer bowl and they insert it into her vagina and then kick it. It's all about absolutely humiliating and decimating and desecrating her corpse. And then after they've enjoyed doing this, and they enjoyed doing this, this was fun for them. They then throw her over the side of a cliff. She came to rest about 40 feet below on rocks. And during the fall, bear in mind, she's already got this incredibly broken body because of the beating. And she already had her skull badly fractured. But then when she's falling, her skull's effectively crushed and a portion of her brain was actually exposed, which is just horrific. Because this is somebody who belongs to somebody, right? We're always talking about these cases and we always know that these human beings belong with and to other human beings, to parents, to children. Imagine knowing that this had happened to your mother or to your daughter, or to your sister, or to your brother. That's the absolute incredible pain and anguish that is manifested through these horrific crimes. Now, of course, they've been so heinous to this poor woman that the back of Loggins truck is literally covered in blood. So at this point, they decide they're gonna take it to a nearby town, Pell City, and this is where they wash the blood and then they wash the mud out. And then they actually go through Vicky's luggage. And after they've gone through it, they then take it to some nearby woods and they just dump it there. They just have no respect whatsoever. And then after this, they dropped Magione back in his home in Birmingham, Alabama. But even though they've dropped him off, they aren't happy. They want more of this decimation of Vicky's body. So first of all, they decide that, well, you know, at the end of the day, she still has incriminating evidence that could potentially identify her and that could cause problems for us. They believe that there's some evidence that could tie them to the killing. So Grayson, Loggins and Duncan, they then all go back to Bald Rock Mountain and they find, of course, Vicky's body. They know exactly where it will be. But the defiling of her corpse is just 
almost unspeakable. It was just horrific. So they attempt to disguise her appearance by mutilating her face. Grayson actually tries to remove her eyes, which, as we know, would not be something that would cause her body not to be identified. So I can only assume the reason that he does it is because he enjoys the idea of doing it. They then cut off her fingers and her thumbs because they don't want fingerprints. They actually kept the fingers as souvenirs. Now, Grayson claimed that he was going to make a necklace out of them, which is kind of, I would say, the mental level, intellect-wise, of Grayson. Because, obviously, he's going to make a necklace, just wear it around the locality. Mm, Grayson, it's an interesting necklace. What is it? It's somebody's fingers. You're a murderer, aren't you? I am. I'm wearing the fingers. Unbelievable. But you can see, can't you, the macabre level of what these individuals are like, mindset-wise. And they actually later down the line, because Mangione hadn't been there, they gave him one of the fingers so that he could keep. And he kept it in a Ziploc bag. Yeah. That really happened. Ziploc bag. I guess that he was hoping that it wouldn't decay. And again, we see these kind of individuals and mementos being very, very important, psychologically anchoring them back to the crime. Also, whilst they were defiling her body, they did attempt to get her teeth out, but they could only actually remove one. But it wasn't about simply making her unrecognizable. That wasn't their main motivation in what they were doing. They were enjoying it. There was this clear, sadistic element to what they did. They really got the most out of her murder. And then, just as they had the act of killing her, they had really enjoyed and got a great sense of satisfaction out of the degradation, the humiliation, and the pain and the suffering that they had inflicted. They really enjoyed it. They also sliced open a chest. They cut out her left lung. So you can see where I'm going with this, can't you? This is not returning to try to disguise the fact that this particular individual could be identified by certain things like fingerprints. They're doing this because they're enjoying the absolute abuse of this woman's body. And even though they removed the lung, what they actually thought that they'd removed was her heart. So basically they believed that they had removed her heart. But as I said, when it comes down to intellect, there's not a lot going on between these guys altogether, let alone as an individual. Also, Loggins actually takes a bite out of her lung and then spits it back into her face. And after they've done that, if that is not hideous enough, they then repeatedly stab her. Now, the next morning after this just diabolical murder, Loggins' girlfriend actually goes looking for him. She must have been somebody with great taste. Just going to throw it out there. When she finds him, she finds Grayson and Duncan asleep in the pickup truck. And it's in a fast food restaurant car park. So she kind of walks into that scene looking for Loggins and finds Grayson and Duncan literally covered in blood and mud. So obviously she's going to be like, what have you been up to, right? At the end of the day, what have you been up to? Why are you covered in blood and mud? And Loggins claims that they'd killed a dog that was chasing his truck. At this point, I hope in my dream sequence of possibility that his girlfriend literally took a spade and I don't know, didn't dig a grave for the dog but used it for another purpose. But as my mother would say, if you hit somebody with a spade and they have no sense, well it won't really do anything for them anyway. Where there's no sense, there's no feeling, as she says not suggesting using violence against people with spades, just saying triggered whenever I think about people or animals being horribly treated. And the fact that this is the excuse that is used shows that they have very little concern morality wise about the way that somebody would view chasing and killing a dog, because that's horrible. We get to a few days later, this is the 26th of February, 1994. 
and a group of hikers, well, they're going around their business on bald rock mountain and they make the worst discovery ever. So they're just going around, hiking, enjoying themselves, the incredible scenery, and then they find Vicky's literally mutilated body. The trauma they must have experienced would be huge. So obviously, immediately, the police launch a murder investigation. There is absolutely no doubt that Vicky's end was created by another's hand. They're not thinking that she's fell over the cliff. They know that there is somebody that they need to seek ASAP. So first of all, they focus a search for a suspect in Vicky's hometown of Tennessee. So they believe that there's a potential that she was killed there and that her body had been dumped in Alabama. And we also know that usually when we're looking at murders like this, it's often somebody that the person knows. It can usually be a partner because if you home in on that person, there'll be motive because the relationship's broken down and so on and so forth. So it makes perfect sense that the police do that. When they do the autopsy, wow, the extent of her injuries is unbelievable. She suffered so catastrophically, so dramatically. It's horrific because we're talking about something happening to somebody. This happened to her. So first of all, her face just covered in lacerations. Every single bone in her face was fractured at least once. The features on the left side of her face basically been erased by the blunt force trauma and almost every single bone in her skull was fractured. The brain tissue was visible through the shattered bone. Her left eye was literally collapsed and her right eye had hemorrhaged. There were two large incisions in a chest where the left lung had been removed and 180 post-mortem stab wounds had been inflicted. So just this violent rampage of her body after death. The pathologist believed that the death had likely been caused by blunt force trauma to her head combined with the asphyxiation on her throat. So the injuries, as far as they were concerned, were consistent with either having been struck on the head with a beer bottle or kicked in the head. Also, loads and loads of bruises, numerous bruises and lacerations on her neck. They believed that that was likely caused by someone who'd been standing on her throat. And the disfigurement of her body was so terrible that she had to be identified literally by an old X-ray of her spine. So they'd really gone to work on her. I mean, we all know that we expect people to have fingerprints or teeth. Those indentations that the dentists take, they often are how people find out, but it was literally an old X-ray of her spine that led to them identifying her. And in the weeks following Vicky's murder, I will tell you now that according to everyone who knew the killers, they displayed absolutely no remorse whatsoever for their actions. Nada. Nothing. It wasn't like one of them was going off and being a little bit upset and sad. It wasn't like they were confessing to people because they felt that they'd done a terrible thing. Just getting on with the business. Just getting on with the business. And apparently whenever they were bored, they would just joke, let's go pick up a hitchhiker. So they are seriously considering, without a doubt, repeating the action. And they actually started as well to boast to the killing to other people, which is just one of those things that even though I cannot joke about what we're talking about, what happened to Vicky is beyond the realms of inhumane. It is just catastrophically disgusting. But what I kind of like is that these imbeciles who are so outside the realms of ration and reality, so superior or arrogant, and also so stupid that they think that it's handy if they just start ingratiating themselves reputation-wise to, you know, people they know. Just go around telling people that I've killed somebody, I don't know, wearing a finger necklace, who knows? But this is what they are doing. And of course, what they do as they always do, 
is they underestimate other people's morality, compassion, and conscience. And we see this time and time and time again. I always talk about Mother Nature. She may be a serial killer, but she always creates a chink in the armor of these killers. There is always just a tiny chip, and that chip is enough to cause a fracture. And it is their bragging. It is their willingness to discuss this crime openly with people that they think that they can trust that is their undoing. Now, Mangione, he just could not resist showing that severed finger to his friends. And one of those friends was absolutely horrified, absolutely blown away by the fact that this person that they knew was comfortable showing them a severed finger of a person that they said they'd murdered. So they contact the police. And I love it when you have those moments in these true crime stories where somebody who could have remained silent, somebody who could just have allowed that to be in their past, move forward, not deal with it. Because remember, they're also dealing with somebody with the capacity to kill. Often people don't say things because they're afraid of consequences and repercussions, but not this person. This person does it. They get in touch with the police straight away. So agents with the Alabama Bureau of Investigation, they're investigating Vicky's murder and they speak to acquaintances of Mangione and they are soon absolutely convinced that this is a teenager who'd been involved in the killing on the 6th of April, 1994. I don't want to sound glib or too sarcastic about the fact that the investigators are like, oh yeah, maybe this is the guy who's been involved. You know, he had a finger and he's like literally telling people that he'd done it. It doesn't take Sherlock Holmes or his sidekick, Dr. Watson, to actually prove that, does it? I mean, he's literally said he's done it. Anyway, agents go to Mangione's house and as they actually approach the door, the teenager's car pulls into the driveway. And at this point, the agents say to him that they're investigating the murder of a woman whose body's been discovered at the bottom of Bald Rock Mountain. Mangione, he states that he'd actually been waiting for the police to come. He even said that he wanted to talk with them. And that suggests potentially there is some kind of conscience within him that he's been expecting that call, so to speak and that he's been maybe considering going in and actually having a conversation with the police about it. Was it because he actually believed that he'd done something wrong? Or was it simply that he thought his time was going to come and it was better to go in and admit it before they found out? Who knows? Mangione also says that he wants his mother at the police station. However, I will tell you now, in spite of the fact that he wants his mother at the police station, he also says, well, I don't want her to actually hear or I'm going to tell you. Which is ironic because I'm picturing a possibility where, you know, you have him sat there with the investigators being interrogated and mum sat next to him with some very heavy duty earmuffs just trying to lip read. What's going on here? What's going on? Did you just say finger? I don't know what the hell's happening here. Can I take, I can't take this off. He won't let me do it. I know that didn't happen. It's just in my dream sequence again. Anyway, this is clear that he's saying in that moment that he expected a call and that he expects his mother is not gonna be happy with the consequence of that conversation. And when they sit him down and they start to question him, it's really quick that he implicates all three of his accomplices. And of course, during that, he's like, I'm going to tell you everything. It went like this. I had three accomplices and it was all their fault. We've all been there, haven't we, in scenarios? Not like this. I was going to hasten to add, not like this. But you know, when you're a kid and you get into trouble and you're like, I would never have done it if it had not been for Mark Perry. Those kind of things. I made Mark Perry up. Don't be looking online. Who's Mark Perry and what did you do with Emma Kenny? I don't know. I throw it in. I threw it in. I did that. I digress. The point is, he just kind of blags and says, nothing to do with me, all to do with them. It's amazing the loyalty level of these kind of not rights, isn't it? So after he's implicated the other three, he says that Grayson is basically the ringleader. 
And he says that he had wanted to kill Vicky. And the reason for that was that Grayson had wanted a sacrifice to Satan. So Grayson, Loggins and Duncan at this point with this information are arrested. And understandably, all four of them are then charged with Vicky's first degree murder. It must be incomprehensible to the police who are listening to this young man describe this brutality and the murder that's taken place and then give the reasoning as it being a sacrifice to the devil. I would love to be in an interview like that. I would have so many questions about what exactly they think they're going to get after it. Because arrested seems to be the most likely, possibly, a death sentence, and then probably a long, hot life for eternity with the devil. But not because you're one of his sidekicks, just because you're one of those who were sent to hell. So during the interrogation, after they've been arrested, they just all try to blame each other. They say that the other's to blame for instigating the murder. Now, of course, this chaos is expected when you are interviewing young people who are blaming one another because they're trying to minimise their involvement. The police decide that Grayson was the ringleader. So that's the person they focus on as far as feeling that they were in charge of the attack that led to Vicky's death. And when it gets to court, it is quite unbelievable because all four of them ultimately plead not guilty to Vicky's murder. All four of them. I mean, they're blaming each other, fair enough, but the fact that none of them are acknowledging any responsibility and are trying to deflect onto the others is something that a defence must have struggled with. I mean, if you've got a defence scenario and this woman has been brutalised in the most heinous of ways, they've been walking around bragging about the murder, so bring in 903 witnesses, one of them's got the finger of that person at home you've had an individual find them in a truck covered in blood and they're like i'm gonna go not guilty can you imagine how that would be for the defense what why why let's just do the old honest bit you did it let's see whether we can reduce your sentence from certain death no i'm just i'm not guilty you had a finger in a ziploc bag it wasn't mine you literally showed it your friends that's when we know about it i'm still not guilty that must have driven the defence to a place and a brink of, shall we say, challenge of a rather large magnitude. But they go not guilty at this point. So Grayson's trial, that begins in Birmingham, Alabama, and this is in January 1996. The prosecution, well, they allege that the killing had definitely got these overtones of satanic ritual. They claim that Vicky had been offered as a sacrifice to Satan. They also found lots of satanic books and literature on the occult that they found in Grayson's possession. And so these are all then submitted as evidence to support this contention. Also, there were satanic drawings, which had been found in the boot of his vehicle. That included a pentagram and a devil's head. So there's all of this, shall we say, content that supports this contention as far as the prosecution are concerned, that they're not just dealing with a group of young pack murderers, they're dealing with something far more malevolent and dark. And clearly the fact that they can put this material in, for a jury who's dealing with one of the most heinous types of murder you could ever describe, it's gonna be compelling, isn't it? Grayson also decides that probably at this point the best way to do it, to, as far as dealing with the court case, is to plead insanity. Yeah, it wasn't me, it was my mental illness. Now, I appreciate there are very rare murders that are then found to be murders that took place because an individual was not in a sane place. It does happen, it's very, very rare. But he claims that his is manic depressive, now that would be bipolar disorder in the UK, and that particular condition is a condition that's aggravated when you take lots of drugs, for example, or you're taking a lot of alcohol. So he says that this exacerbates these mental health issues and that's why he acted in the manner that he did. Not sure where all the satanic stuff comes in there, Grayson. 
Not sure how that relates to your bipolar. It's certainly not in the classification system. At the end of the day, it's not really making a lot of sense. Anyway, what they do manage to do is they manage as a prosecution to find that he absolutely knew the difference between right and wrong at the time that he carried out the murder. So because of that, he's found guilty. Now, Loggins, Duncan, Magnione, they're also found guilty in separate trials. Now, due to what I told you earlier on about those catastrophic, horrific, torturous injuries that led to her death, the jury recommended a sentence of death was appropriate in relation to Grayson, Loggins and Duncan. They said that the killing definitely fitted being especially heinous, atrocious and cruel. Vicky, as we know, she would have endured horrific, prolonged physical and mental suffering. And, of course, we can additionalise that, they enjoyed doing it. There's evidence they'd enjoyed it. And furthermore, she'd been killed during the course of a kidnapping and a robbery. So at the point when she had asked to get out of the vehicle and they'd not allowed her to get out of the vehicle, essentially, that marks the kidnapping element. Now, also, they took some of her possessions after her death. So there was a ring that they took and that constituted a robbery. So accordingly, it was a capital offence. So the three ended up getting sentenced to death by electric chair. Now, what's interesting is Grayson, he later elected to die by nitrogen hypoxia. Meanwhile, we've got Mangione. Now, he was 16 at the time of the offence. And remember, he hadn't actually taken part in the post-mortem mutilation of Vicky's body. So he ends up getting sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. When you think about the diabolical nature of the crime, it is unsurprising to me that they are the sentences. Then we get to 2005 and this is following the decision in the case of Roper versus Simmons. The Supreme Court, they rule it's unconstitutional for an under 18 year old to be sentenced to death. Now, everybody has a different viewpoint on the death sentence, whether you agree or disagree. I do find it really strange that you could be 17 years of age and 360 four days old and not be sentenced to death. But if you live that extra 24 hours, you apparently can go to death for it. But anyway, this is the rule. So subsequently, the Alabama state courts voided Loggins and Duncan's death sentences. They ended up changing them to life without the possibility of parole. Grayson, he's 18 at the time of the offense. He of course isn't so fortunate. So he remained on death row and again, I'm not saying what's right or wrong. I'm certainly not suggesting that they shouldn't have faced the death penalty or they should have faced the death penalty. But I don't get that one of them who was 18 gets the death penalty and the others are all kind of given an opportunity to live their lives and serve time inside for the rest of their lives, so to speak. Because that is strange when you look at what went on in that crime. Now, by all accounts, I will tell you, Login seemed to progress well in prison. Maybe it's because of the discipline. You know, he'd never really experienced that on the outside. Apparently his IQ increased during his incarceration. And having previously been able to engage in education and deal with that kind of academia, his reading age when he was in prison actually increased to college level. And a psychologist ended up concluding that he had developed the empathy and the capacity to even develop caring and loving relationships. And so much so, whilst in prison, he developed this pen pal relationship with a woman whom he later married. And according to her, she found him to be open, warm and caring. And she claimed that he set the standard for her in relationships with men. That's right, that's actually a quote. That he, a guy who murdered a completely defenseless, helpless woman, he set the standard for her in relationships with men. I can only imagine what the standard she had was before. Was she potentially communicating with Ed Kemper? BTK, throwing it out there, 
just the odd violent serial killer. Maybe that's where the standard was originally. But yes, what a darling he was in her life. Not sure if this says more about her. I think it does. I think it says more about her. Previous relationships with men. Just throwing it out there. And it's also worth noting that in spite of the fact that, you know, he set the bar, apparently they did get divorced. So didn't end well, so to speak. He actually remains incarcerated at William E. Donaldson Correctional Facility, and that's in Jefferson County, Alabama. He's now aged 46. And he's actually 28 years into his life sentence. And I do tell you this, I don't want him to ever be released. I think it's far better for society if he remains locked up and he never gets to be footloose. Sorry, it's a terrible joke. It's just that Kenny Loggins is actually in Footloose. And I don't think it's okay. They have the same name, but it was an opportunity to make a really terrible joke at his expense. He will never be Footloose and Fancy Free. Anyway, that's where he is. Then we've got Trace Duncan. Well, he remains incarcerated at St. Clair Correctional Facility, and that's in Alabama. Now, according to his incarceration details, he may one day be granted parole. Genuinely. If that doesn't make you shiver, I don't know what will. Then we have Louis Mangione, and he is currently imprisoned at the Bibb Correctional Facility in Alabama. And like Duncan, he may one day be paroled. So that's two of them looking at potentially walking our streets again. Now, Kerry Grayson, he actually remains on death row at Holman Prison, Alabama. And I would imagine that's because he's exhausting literally every avenue of appeal. You know how they like to do that. Don't kill me. I'm really not a bad person. You literally are a terrible person. I'm not a bad person. You worship the devil. I'm just deeply faithful of the devil. Stop saying the devil. You just don't really understand Satanism. I do. I do. I know quite a lot about Satanism. Because, you know, people like the Night Stalker were Satanists, and they weren't very nice. Okay, well, please let me out. No. Just throwing it out there. That's how the conversation would go, as far as I'm concerned. Not okay. Not okay at all. Now, the murder of Vicky de Blier, it's not a well-publicised case at all, and it should be. It should be because it's utterly terrifying, and because her life had great meaning, and I hate the fact that I can put pictures of her killers in this video, and I cannot honour her within it by placing an image of who she was. She had meaning to many, and she never got to go home to her mother. She was denied all of that, and it's heartbreaking. I have tried really hard. I've literally exhausted every avenue trying to do this, and I just can't find any. The fact that people won't know about this case, again, it just demonstrates how so often these human beings with infinite meaning in the world are taken and they're not given legacy. So I hope I've given her legacy here. I think that this case is also an absolutely terrifying reminder of what I consider the perfect storm. We talk about sliding doors moments a lot in these videos, but this is such a truth. Individuals make decisions in moments and the ramifications are enormous and in this case deadly. Think about the factors that contribute to that moment where Vicky ends up getting in that car. The ingredients that needed to come together, it's astonishing when you think about it. You've got a group of disaffected teenagers with troubled, dysfunctional backgrounds. You've got far-right associations, fascination with the occult also spurred on with this gang stroke pack mentality. Add to that heavy drug and alcohol use, and then this defenseless, unsuspecting victim, just simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. And when all of those culminate in that moment, the consequences are beyond horrific. I cannot comprehend how it must have been for her family to get those calls, for them to realise she was never coming home. 
even for the partner who dropped her at that place and position the night that she was taken, the ramifications and consequences for those must be enormous. I don't believe that every human being can be rehabilitated, I really don't. And I think in cases like this, it is hard to imagine that these young men who acted like monsters will ever truly be safe to walk our streets. Maybe I'm wrong, but I also think, should we ever take a chance in scenarios like this? Is it ever okay to truly risk that some other woman in some other moment may fall foul of characters like these. I would be really interested to know your thoughts. Maybe you do think that these guys should be given a second chance at life. Maybe you, like I, think it's a bit strange that a few days can be the difference between you being put to death and potentially being given parole. Give me your thoughts. If you've liked this content, remember, Wednesdays and Sundays, every single week, crime and consistency is my catchphrase. I will always release it without doubt same time each week join me for a live chat just get involved my true crime community is awesome and like i said if you want to see me in the uk some really big theaters coming up then please do and come say hi have a picture with me at the end and a big old cuddle i love it take care guys and of course this is for vicky she may not be out there on the web her picture might not be available for us to see but the compassion that every single one of us will be feeling right now, without a doubt, is far-reaching. Take care. Be safe.